Well, hello and everybody, welcome um, to a new technical talk series that I'm kicking off here um, on OpenShift Commons around um, having more of a conversational tone and bringing together some of the thinkers, creators, and coders to discuss some of the interesting ideas and innovations that are happening in technology today. Um, not necessarily things that are um, what we normally talk about in OpenShift, but um, some of the underpinnings and other technologies that are coming out. Um, and today, I'm really pleased to have um, Aparna Sinha with us, who's going to be talking about um, Kubernetes 1.7. The release just came out last week. Um, if you're in our space, it would have been hard to miss all of the announcements that came out. There was a lot that went into this one. Um, a lot of Red Hatters worked on it. A lot of people from across um, the entire ecosystem of cloud natives have um, worked on this release. And I think um, there's, I probably listened to at least three or four updates on it. And each time I find out something else that's in 1.7 that I didn't realize got in, because there was a lot of alpha stuff in the previous releases that are now beta and now, um, and a few more alpha things that got snuck in to 1.7. So. Um, Aparna is the group product manager for uh, Kubernetes at Google. Um, so she's one of the, the very well versed in what's gone in um, and what's coming in the upcoming releases. So I'm going to let her introduce herself and talk about it for about a half an hour, and then we'll have some Q&A. So go ahead. Great. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for um, hosting me on your show. Um, as you mentioned, um, this is a very exciting release, Kubernetes 1.7. It launched just before the July 4th holiday on Thursday, June 29th. Um, and it is um, quite a feature full release. If you look at the release notes, they're actually multiple pages long. Uh, and so one of the things that um, we tried to do as the product management group uh, within the Kubernetes community is to synthesize what uh, user facing functionality um, is, uh, is basically the highlight of this release. Um, so we synthesized that and also in, in this discussion, I'd like to describe some of the value that users can get out of these features. Before I do that, um, I do want to reiterate, as you said, there's a broad community uh, consisting of multiple companies that have contributed to this release and in general contribute to the Kubernetes uh, releases. Uh, Red Hat uh, and Google being uh, very prominent uh, participants, uh, and there are many features in this release on which we collaborated uh, extensively uh, between Google and Red Hat to deliver those features I'm very proud of, uh, and I, I think uh, uh, our users will find those fe features very useful and impressive. So with that, I'll get into um, a little bit about 1.7, uh, and I'll be scrolling down as I walk through this blog post. Um, it's really a milestone release uh, for uh, Kubernetes, uh, the community, and on all of the commercial distributions of Kubernetes and all the tools that are built on top of it. Um, the main themes uh, that uh, we would like to highlight uh, are, you know, extended security. And this is particularly important because now there is much more adoption of Kubernetes in large enterprises, both on premises as well as on public cloud. And um, what that means is that there is a lot more um, need for robust security and in fact secure multi-tenancy to be supported fully in Kubernetes. We're very happy that um, users are using Kubernetes in this fashion uh, and that we are um, able to uh, build towards a, a strong roadmap for security and multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. And 1.7 has several new features in that regard. I also um, want to highlight the other two themes. Uh, the second theme is around multiple workloads. And we've been working on stateful workloads as a community for quite some time. Red Hat and Google, I think, have been foremost in um, stateful workload technology uh, and adding that to Kubernetes. And this release actually brings in support for upgrading stateful applications, stateful applications being things like databases um, and batch processing. And then the last uh, big theme of the release is extensibility. Again, I think extensibility features are driven by the demand from large enterprises who are adopting Kubernetes in production. Uh, 
um, the extensibility needs that they have uh, are related to bringing in custom business logic that they've written that they want to be uh, included into Kubernetes. It's also driven by uh, additional third-party and internally developed APIs that um, uh, users would like to use in the same way that they that they manage other API features in Kubernetes. Uh, and so the extensibility features really broaden the scope of what Kubernetes can deliver, and it makes and, and it makes it much more usable and customizable by our power users in our uh, large enterprise environments. So those are our three themes uh, for this release. Again, there's more than, I think, 30 features, uh, but um, uh, what I would say are the major themes are security hardening, stateful application uh, support, and extensibility. I'm going to go through each of them, and in that process, I'm going to walk through the detailed features. Then I'll also cover some of the additional um, highlight features. Again, there's a very long list. I will not be able to get through all of the features, but there is a uh, multi-page release notes document where you can find everything that's new in the release. So um, first, uh, speaking about the security enhancements, um, there's um, at least five that I would like to call out. Um, the first, um, perhaps most exciting one, is the Network Policy API. The Network Policy API um, was beta uh, in the last release, so it's not new. However, it has been promoted to stable. And with that, there are some changes that have been made, made to the uh, Network Policy API that, that improve its performance. Um, it's a much awaited feature. Uh, and again, um, as a community, we have been focused on stabilization. So moving this API to st stable means that it is ready for production use in large enterprises. What network policy enables um, is essentially a basic foundation for multi-tenancy. If you want to have multiple users and multiple tenants share the same cluster, you need some way for the pods or applications um, to communicate with each other. And you, you, you may want to set policies on which pods can speak to which other pods. And that is what network policy enables you to do. That's a simplification, um, but that's essentially the use case for network policy. And we find that um, increasingly, uh, users are running uh, multiple services for multiple different teams, um, and these are um, all running in the same cluster and sometimes across multiple clusters. So network policy um, allows you to control uh, the network traffic uh, and, and set up governance rules around which apps can talk to which other apps. The second uh, feature here uh, is node authorizer. Node Authorizer, um, which is implemented through an admission control plugin, um, essentially restricts the kubelet's access to objects um, that, um, that it should have access to. Kubelet is the agent that runs on the node, uh, the Kubernetes agent that runs on the node. The node is, is usually a VM or um, in a bare metal configuration, it could just be a machine. Um, the kubelet, that agent, um, before Node Authorizer would have access to, uh, you know, Kubernetes objects uh, such as secrets um, and other objects in other nodes. And there's one kubelet per node. So um, what we didn't want to have happen is should a node get compromised, um, you know, that kubelet on that node should not have access to other nodes and, and be able to, you know, compromise the other nodes in the cluster as well. So with Node Authorizer, the kubelet's access is restricted just to the objects that are scheduled on that node. Uh, this, is a, this is very important, obviously, for isolation and to prevent that kind of, um, that kind of risk in the case of a node compromise. The third uh, feature in this release, um, uh, again related to the security theme, is uh, encryption for secrets. Um, and this is one where um, Red Hat had a huge role in developing this feature. Um, and, and of course, uh, as did the security experts at Google, um, it, this was a um, very important uh, feature from a overall uh, security perspective for Kubernetes. Um, secrets were not previously encrypted in etcd, so at rest. Um, uh, secrets were uh, were uh, were not encrypted. Uh, now, in in for example, Google Cloud, um, that's less of an issue uh, because uh, the the etcd um, data store is not actually 
accessible by users because since we since in for example in container engine google manages the masters and also it's backed up to um to uh you know to google cloud storage uh, but uh, for those users who are using the open source version an unmanaged version of kubernetes uh, this could have posed a, a risk the fact that secure that uh, secrets were not encrypted at rest and so that is we're very excited that that is now available as alpha um, um for, for all users of the open source software at large. And it'll, over the next couple of releases, be moving to beta and then stable. Uh, the next feature is kubeless uh, kubelet tls bootstrapping um, actually kubelet tls bootstrapping existed uh, but what it what is new is that it now supports certificate rotation uh, so client and server certificates are both uh, rotated and that's important because the certificate can get stale or um, you know if someone has access to it and, and it isn't rotated and that user is no longer um, um, uh, th that the old certificate can, can be abused. And so certificate rotation is an important feature also uh, to maintain uh, the security of the cluster. And then the last one that I that I'm that we that we chose to highlight um, is um, audit logs. And audit logs are again very important for large enterprises. They want to be able to, to have a audit trail um, uh, on, on what exactly uh, happened, um, and what were all of the actions, who took the actions uh, in the Kubernetes cluster. And so audit logs um, are now stored uh, by the API server. They're more extensible, um, so, and they have uh, support for filtering. So you can look at specific um, events uh, and also support for webhooks so that you can then take these audit logs and you can surface them in a different, uh, different UI or different front end. Uh, and there's also uh, a richer data set that, will, that is available for uh, system audit. So net net, um, you know, I would boil down the security features to uh, continued progression towards multi-tenancy and the node isolation and the uh, pod to pod policy um, for communication. These are things that are foundational building blocks for multi-tenancy. In the future, in 1.8 and 1.9 and, and so on, you'll find um, pod identity um, will augment these features and provide even more granular uh, multi-tenants capabilities. And then uh, the other pieces, encryption, uh, certificate rotation, and audit logging, they really help to bring in um, you know, more security uh, in depth within the Kubernetes cluster. So that's a um, high-level overview of the security features in this release. Again, security being a major, three, major theme for Kubernetes 1.7, driven very much by our enterprise users and their requirements. Second major theme, uh, as I mentioned, is around stateful workloads. Stateful workloads are uh, things like databases. It's particularly important for Kubernetes because um, in the in the beginning and early days of containers, um, containers were supposedly good for stateless applications. Uh, and many um, users um, did not have the functionality to use um, containers in, for stateful applications. Uh, the problem that creates is that uh, you have your, say, web front end, um, which is stateless, running in Kubernetes or you know running in containers, and then your database and or any other state, stateful part of your application has to run in a VM. And so now, from a um, operating team perspective, you have to manage two different types of uh, infrastructure um, for the same application. This is doable, but it's not it's not ideal, uh, and many users um, have have um, wanted to use Kubernetes for as as the standard for all of their workloads. Um, so we, uh, as a community, started working on stateful application support a little over a year ago, actually, actually more than a year ago. Um, and in fact, um, the construct for stateful application there are, there are several there are several foundational pieces that support um, stateful applications. One is, of course, storage management, and there's a there's a whole host of features um, that were that were uh, released over the course of last year, and, and a big release um, at the Berlin launch um, of was uh, dynamic storage provisioning, which, which is in support of, it's provisioning storage in support of um, all applications, but particularly important for stateful applications. So, so I, you know, we have a pretty robust set of storage management features in Kubernetes. Um, but then how do you roll out a cluster database um, like, um, say, uh, Elasticsearch or Zookeeper, uh, one of these um, more modern 
or CockroachDB, one of these more, more modern uh, scale out databases, how do you provision them in a Kubernetes cluster? That was a problem that was um, solved by our community, um, I would say mid of last year with the introduction of stateful sets. Um, so just like uh, there are daemon sets uh, and replica sets, these are constructs in Kubernetes. Um, there's also stateful sets. Stateful sets essentially allow you to provision a, a stateful workload, such as a scale-out database on your Kubernetes cluster. And that's all well and good. Stateful sets went beta in um, November of last year, uh, and uh, many users have been uh, adopting stateful sets. There were a couple of problems, though, and that's what this release, this is a key release, uh, because it addresses those outstanding issues. Um, two problems in particular. One is, now that I've rolled out my database, how do I update it? As you can imagine, it's very important to be able to update your database. Uh, and if things don't go well, you know, to roll it back as well. Um, so with this release, uh, the team has introduced stateful set updates. And in fact, um, the update process of stateful applications can be automated through the stateful set update feature. And there are a range of different update strategies that users can use to update those databases. Uh, one of the more popular strategies is rolling updates. Uh, there are also other strategies such as update on delete and so forth. And this is particularly useful uh, for things like Kafka, Zookeeper, Etcd, um, you know, Elasticsearch, um, potentially Redis, MySQL, CockroachDB. These are some of the common databases that uh, our users have started using stateful sets for. And so now with 1.7, this is a beta feature uh, to be able to update these databases um, automatically. Uh, the second uh, problem uh, that we that we sought to solve here is sometimes when you roll out uh, a stateful database, it needs to be rolled out such that uh, it's in order. The uh, the provisioning of the pods uh, requires a certain ordering, but for other databases, um, the ordering is not required, and you can actually provision them in parallel. Um, previously, we only had ordered execution. And uh, that led to some performance um, bottlenecks because for databases that didn't require the order, ordered execution, we still did ordered execution. And so we, we received feedback that, you know, this is uh, so for some of these databases, this is taking too long. And so in this release, um, we have pod management policies, which allows you to choose different types of rollout, uh, parallel or in order. And um, that can be a major performance improvement. I think in particular for Zookeeper um, and for uh, Kafka, which is based on Zookeeper, uh, we have a demo that shows the performance uh, improvement here. So that's the big announcement with regard to stateful workloads. Um, the other uh, supporting pieces um, are alpha support for local storage. This was one of the most frequently requested features associated with uh, stateful applications. So users who were uh, deploying stateful applications on Kubernetes wanted to be able to use the local storage. And this is mostly for performance. If you have, if you require high performance from your database, you may not want to use clustered or networked storage um, uh, with that database. You may want to use the local storage that's available on that VM or on that machine. And this was previously um, not something that was uh, supported out of the box. Um, and so we're very excited that um, with 1.7, we're able to announce alpha support for this feature. And so now local storage volumes on the same VM uh, uh, can be accessed through the standard uh, persistent volume, persistent volume claim interface, and are also available through storage classes, making, again, the dynamic storage provisioning piece available for local storage with stateful sets. So you can see how those, th how those things come together uh, to create, I think, uh, what is a really compelling um, and, I think, industry-leading capability uh, in terms of stateful application support. Um, uh, I think at this point, um, Kubernetes is, is um, starting to bust some of those myths about whether uh, only whether containers are only good for stateful work, uh, st stateless workloads. I think uh, with the number of users um, uh, that are using these features and the additions that we've made with this release, it's going to become much more common to use, again, the modern scale-out databases and run th them along with your stateless applications all on the same underlying infrastructure. 
So that's the major announcement there. A couple of other new things, uh, daemon sets. Uh, daemon sets. Um, daemon sets are essentially when you want to have um, a pod uh, deployed in every node. So, for example, if you want to monitor every node and you want to install an agent in every node for that monitoring, you would use the concept of daemon sets. Daemon sets essentially create one pod per node. Um, another use case for it would be if you wanted to have a networking plugin, so a monitoring plugin or a networking plugin or anything that you wanted to install one of in each node. Uh, daemon sets have existed for a while, um, and daemon sets can also be updated, and the upgrade capability has also existed for a while. What is new in 1.7 is the ability to roll back an upgrade, and in fact, it's a smart rollback, um, and we also have more history um, of the, the rollout and rollback. Um, so that capability is now added to daemon sets. Uh, the last piece, a piece of storage OS volume plugin, which provides um, highly available clustered cluster-wide persistent storage. Um, I'm not going to go deep into that, but that's also something that um, is, a, is a, feature, a new feature here, and it can be particularly useful uh, in on-premise environments. So that's the set of features. Um, that uh, are highlights in 1.7 for stateful application support. And again, uh, updates, major capability, uh, performance improvement, and local storage, those being the, the major things. Uh, the last but not least uh, theme of the release is extensibility. And again, one on which um, Red Hat uh, and Google collaborated extensively. Uh, it's very important uh, because uh, we have a lot of large enterprise users, and again, as I mentioned at the beginning, those users are interested in extending the capabilities of Kubernetes, either with custom business logic that is specific to their enterprise, or um, by adding third-party uh, or user-created APIs to their clusters. So the first of those features is um, API aggregation. Uh, API aggregation uh, is, I would say, yes, the most powerful extensibility feature in this release, and it is beta in this release, um, it basically allows users to add a Kubernetes-style API um, to their cluster. So the Kubernetes API comes built in with lots of different capabilities. You know, you can do, you can you know, roll out new deployments, um, you know, you can uh, set up replicas and so on. There are many, many capabilities. But if you, for example, wanted to write a new object, something that combines existing uh, pieces of Kubernetes and calls it a new object, and that's that's or or it's a brand new object, and you want um, to specify that object for your enterprise, uh, and you want it to be available in the same way and manageable in the same way that the rest of the objects in the Kubernetes API, then you can use the API aggregation feature and add your custom API to um, the to your Kubernetes clusters, and this can be done without uh, recompiling um, and, and and rebooting your cluster. And that's the kind of the major thing. You don't really want to have to um, restart everything. Um, uh, so API aggregation works at runtime. Um, there are some good examples of this. Um, we, we've seen users that have built uh, passes on top of Kubernetes. And for the purpose of those passes, they have created many um, uh, you know, new sort of objects. And, and, and so those can be added through API aggregation. Um, Another use case is that uh, for adding service catalog. Service catalog is a relatively new concept uh, in the Kubernetes open source community, uh, and it has a uh, it has an API uh, that allows you to essentially list um, a set of services uh, that you want to make available to your team or to your company in a catalog. And uh, for for service discovery and and ease of service deployment. Uh, so, th so the service catalog can be added as an uh, as a third-party API uh, through this API aggregation mechanism. Those are just two examples. There are many, many more things that can be done uh, using API aggregation. So, very excited about that feature. Um, there's actually another feature. Um, uh, it's listed here under additional features. It's also an ex extensibility feature, uh, which is support for external admission controllers. Uh, and this is this is currently alpha support, something that uh, was worked on extensively, again, as I said, by Red Hat and Google. Um, and I believe Clayton Coleman has talked about both API aggregation and, and uh, external admission controllers. Uh, and I, those are definitely uh, talks that are worth watching. Uh, so it, it, external admission controllers, they basically allow users to add custom business logic uh, to the API server. 
um, for modifying objects as they are created and or for validating policy. So what's an example of this? Um, there's a um, there's a lot of recent interest in a network proxy called Istio. Um, and Istio is essentially a sidecar proxy. It's a, uh, it's a new container that gets deployed um, in every pod. And what it does is it functions as a network proxy. It can allow, uh, it can monitor network traffic, uh, but it can also do other things that a proxy does, such as authenticating. And so it enables service-to-service -service authentication, which is something that users have wanted for quite some time uh, in Kubernetes. But also it does things like load balancing. Anyway, so in a Kubernetes cluster, if you want to have uh, Istio running, you have to inject this sidecar proxy into every pod. Um, and one of the things, um, the, the, the main mechanism um, that enables uh, doing this in an easier way, in an easy way, is the use of external admission control plugins. So um, what that does is you can think of um, Istio as essentially uh, business logic um, that um, you want uh, to add to your server. So it modifies the existing pods in your cluster. Uh, and so you can use external admission controllers to that mechanism uh, to add that uh, Istio sidecar to your cluster uh, without disruption. Other things you could do is you could validate whether, you know, um, a certain policy uh, around what your pods um, are or what your pods do uh, can be uh, validated uh, through this type of mechanism as well. So those are two uh, main extensibility features uh, that I think our users will find very um, valuable um, as they uh, deploy and, and expand their use of Kubernetes uh, for enterprise use cases. Um, the other extensibility features uh, that, that, that we do want to highlight are with regard to the container runtime interface. And this is work that's been ongoing over the course of several releases. Uh, in this particular release, uh, the CRI has been enhanced um, with new RPC calls uh, to, to, to retrieve metrics. Uh, there's a new set of validation tests that have been written for this interface. The validation tests are important because then other runtimes uh, can uh, validate themselves um, you know, kind of more in a self-sufficient manner uh, to, to provide support for CRI. So again, just backing up a little bit, the container runtime interface was developed uh, in the interest of code health and in the interest of extensibility to allow um, not just the Docker runtime, but also things like the Rocket runtime or the Cryo runtime or uh, hypervisor-based runtimes or the variety of runtimes that our users might be interested in using. Um, Docker since then, um, since the early days, has now um, uh, split out the core runtime and donated it, it to the CNCF, and that uh, runtime is now called Container D, and it's in active development. Uh, there is alpha integration with Container D um, uh, for, uh, within Kubernetes 1.7 using the Container Runtime interface. And there's also a in-depth post on the CRI that you can follow here. Uh, so that's the summary of our extensibility uh, theme for this release. Um, uh, and so, uh, again, th th those are the three major themes going back, um, uh, you know, the, the security, enterprise security features, uh, stateful workload support, and extensibility. Those are the high-level uh, three themes that I would um, suggest that users keep in mind as they try out 1.7. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a longer list. Um, some of the others that we highlighted in this blog post, I think one that's important is third-party resource, because third-party resource, which is also an extensibility mechanism, has been deprecated with this release. Um, the, our deprecation, I'm sorry, our deprecation policy it's such that um, uh, it's it, third-party resource is not going to be removed um, uh, in this release, so you can continue to use it, but you should plan uh, to uh, uh, to move all of your TPR objects to the new API, which is uh, called CRD or Custom Resource Definitions. Uh, it's a cleaner API. It resolves a number of use cases and corner corner cases um, that uh, that were. Uh, that were sticky points with TPR. We got a lot of feedback on TPR. Uh, and so if you are using the TPR beta feature, uh, there is a migration guide that is linked here uh, to migrate to CRD, and hopefully you will all see great improvements uh, with that migration. And then ultimately in the next release, which is Kubernetes 1.8, TPR will no longer be supported, and so it will be removed. So once you migrate to 1.8, it's important to uh, make sure that all TPR uh, 
usage is is uh, prior prior to one point eight upgrade move to CRDs. Uh, that's in a nutshell the set of features um, uh, that we that we highlighted. Again, uh, complete list is in the release notes. Um, I would like to say a little bit more about um, you know the growth of the community. The community, uh, the open source community, continues to grow. Uh, is very healthy. There are a number of different companies and many, many independent contributors uh, that made this release possible and are continuing to work together to make the future releases possible. We are already in uh, deep planning stages for 1.8. Um, the um, on the customer front, um, actually, so together, uh, I guess we've pushed more than 50,000 commits uh, since the beginning of the uh, of the project, and that's just limited to the to the main Kubernetes repo. Um, it is worth pointing out that uh, in the interest of code health and in the interest of stability, uh, the, Kubernetes, the main Kubernetes repo is being restricted, uh, more and more restricted to just the core components of um, what most all users uh, use uh, within Kubernetes. And many of the sort of um, uh, umbrella and extens uh, ext um, uh, extensions to Kubernetes are now being moved off uh, into extend uh, into associated repos, and this move um, and cleanup of the re of the repositories is bringing overall stability to the project, as well as making it much much faster for contributors to contribute and develop. Again, this is important because Kubernetes is one of the fastest growing open source projects ever, uh, and we are coming up with how to manage the project as um, uh, as as the world turns, <laughs> as <laughs> as Kubernetes is, is, is rolling out. Uh, it's been a, a very interesting community development process. Um, and, um, you know, we've, we've seen lots of other projects like OpenStack and you know, even Linux and stuff. It, it's an evolving model of, of how to get involved in a project and how to manage it. And um, so far, the Kubernetes um, community has, has done a, a pretty awesome job, especially one of the things that I like to point out is that the special interest groups and how those drive um, the features and the functions and the process of what gets incorporated into next releases and managing them. It's been um, the coordination of that has been pretty awesome um, to date and hopefully it will, will continue to, to do that. And the other thing that's really been, you know, as I said at the beginning, is always every time I listen to another 1.7 release, I hear something else that I didn't note before and in this one what was interesting to me was the audit logs which i hadn't really um thought about a lot um in the past and now that we're moving into sort of an enterprise um a mass adoption of kubernetes out there in the world this becomes more and more important than ever um and, and will be something that i, I think we could explore a little bit more too and i'm pleased to see that one of one of the questions that um that I have um, for you is maybe if you could explain a little bit when you say something is an alpha um, release bit or a beta release bit or it's something that's stable and incorporated into the in, into production. If you could explain a little bit of that because I think there's probably a few people who are very new to um, OpenShift. Yes. No, not OpenShift, Kubernetes was my bad. Right, right. Um, so alpha features are uh, subject to complete changes. Um, alpha is essentially um, an early uh, experimental version. So when the community first comes up with a solution for a problem, say, um, uh, let's see, what's alpha in this release? Um, extension, uh, external admission controllers. So we recognized that, you know, it's important uh, to have an external admission controllers. This would be a really key addition um, you know, and really uh, make it possible for our enterprise users to use Kubernetes with so many other, um, you know, so many other um, uh, uh, custom, uh, to, to bring in so much other custom lo business logic and or so many other tools that they've been dying to use. So when we, when we do that, then we, um, you know, there's a design proposal in the community and uh, you know, the, everyone will sort of collace around a particular solution and then, you know, a solution will be developed and it'll be launched as alpha. And that means that, hey, we've got kind of the rudimentary building blocks here. Please try it. Tell us if this is what uh, you're looking for. 
in this solution. We try and have some um, feedback from um, early adopters about whether alpha features actually hit the mark for what they're supposed to do. But often alpha features are incomplete. Um, you know, it's the first installments towards um, towards what's needed in the future. And so when you look at the issue on GitHub, you'll, you'll see that, okay, we consider this to be shippable as an alpha, but then here's a longer roadmap of what we need to add to this feature. And in many cases in making those additions, we change how the alpha functionality is working. So there's no guarantee with an alpha feature that the way the feature works is going to continue to be how the feature works. And that's extremely important for our users to understand. You know, many Kubernetes users are at the bleeding edge um, and uh, Kubernetes being such a um, rapidly uh, developing project, um, people are waiting for these new features. Uh, and sometimes uh, and it's great that, that, that users adopt alpha features um, and that they give feedback to the community, but it is also important not to use alpha features in production and certainly to keep in mind that there is no guarantee and most often alpha features do change completely um, in terms of the implementation. And so when a feature moves to beta, then there is more of a guarantee that says, you know, now we've sort of figured out exactly how this API is going to work and now we've graduated it to beta and the way that this API works and the way that it is specified, this is likely to stay the same. Um, but it may still be incomplete. There may, for example, when you look at stateful sets, stateful sets are beta, but there are, but there are core pieces of functionality that are missing, such as the support for updates. So they were beta in November of last year, but we didn't have support for upgrade, up, upgrades. And you can't really take stateful sets to GA until you have support for upgrades. And even now, while we have support for upgrades, there's not really good support for rollbacks. So there will be, uh, we will be adding um, you know, additional features to uh, stateful sets over the next couple of releases with the goal of moving stateful sets to GA. Um, so when we move a feature to GA or stable, such as network policy, that means the API is now stable. And uh, we think that as a community, all of the basic functionality that is needed to run this uh, to, to run this feature and this set of features in production is complete. And so uh, there really shouldn't be uh, any major gaps at that point in uh, the, the, the feature should as a whole be very usable, um, you know, in an enterprise ready production fashion. Uh, but even beta features, you know, you can use them, but you have to recognize that um, while they're less likely to change, there will be additions um, uh, and, and, the, and the functionality may not be complete. So that's the difference between alpha, beta, and stable. So what stated, what stated the service, the service catalog? catalog? at the moment the service catalog is actually i believe it's not part of the the main kubernetes repo it's one of those extensions um so we don't track its state as part of the uh the the, the product management group but per my recollection it is alpha yeah i, I think so too um and there's a couple of things that's amazing see if that helps at all i'm not sure um but I think there's a number of things that are coming with service catalog that I, a lot of people have been waiting for too, but it is, I, I'm pretty sure, at an alpha state at the moment. There's, there's one of the things with Kubernetes, and I think pointing out that the service catalog is one another, um, there are a number of ways that the community has managed to um, keep the, the big tent from growing too big um, by putting these uh, other ancillary projects outside of the Kubernetes repo so that Kubernetes itself can grow and go through these stages. And some of them, um, and a lot of the extensibility pieces that we're putting in place are part of what makes that um, possible. Um, so like service catalog, uh, some of the stuff with Prometheus and in other you know, monitoring tools and things, just keeping them outside of um, the tent. And I think that's one of the reasons why this community is, is potentially not only the fastest growing, but probably the one of the better projects in order to get to a stable enterprise ready um, as quickly as it has done um, and, and to get so many companies betting on it the way that they have. Um, so 1.8 is in flux right now. We're all kind of um, debating about what should be in 1.8. Um, what, what do you have um, for a secret wish list for 1.8? Uh, that you're looking forward to getting into the next release? 
Yes, uh, that's a great segue, um, particularly your comments around stability. Um, so I am hoping that 1.8 will be a stability release. Um, we've been, as a community, uh, moving between, um, you know, kind of a TikTok cadence where you have a stability release, a feature, feature release, another stability release, another feature release. So 1.6 was a stability release where we moved features from beta to stable and graduated alpha to beta. And 1.8 is a similar uh, release. And from a PM group perspective, we are pushing for there to be no new alpha features. It's hard to hold back and say no new alpha features. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, and it's an open source community. There's no hammers or anything. You know, we don't have any, cons we can't really constrain, but, but by and large, there is agreement in the community that uh, we need stability. And then that is, a, that is actually a feature from a user perspective, just stability itself. So I'm hoping that 1.8 will be largely a stability release. Um, some of the things that we want to move to beta, for example, local storage uh, in support for stateful workloads is, was Alpha in 1.7, and that's such a high demand feature, we hope that we can move that to beta. Also, um, encryption of secrets, uh, I mentioned that that was an alpha feature, and again, that's such an important feature for security that I do hope that we'll be able to move that to beta. Um, uh, we'll see about uh, external admission controllers. Again, these are such critical uh, and important features. We hope to move those to beta uh, in 1.8. But overall, um, I think the, uh, the the part you mentioned about um, extensibility being a driver for stability that is um, that is that has become uh, much more fleshed out within the Kubernetes community. There is a new SIG that has been formed, which is called the Kubernetes Architecture SIG, and the Kubernetes Architecture SIG has laid out a diagram for how uh, all of the different uh, parts of Kubernetes are organized. So, what's at the core? You know, what's uh, client facing? what's uh, sort of infrastructure facing and they have said you know here are the group of layers that are you know part of the uh, part of the main kubernetes repo and then a lot of other things have been broken out as extensions and so what i expect to happen in 1.8 is some of the pieces that are broken out as extensions as extensions already have interfaces like there's a network interface there's a storage interface there's a runtime interface but there are other pieces that don't have good extensions like identity so you can plug in different identity providers and cloud uh, cloud provider the cloud provider interface has sort of been petering along there's been a little bit of work even in this release there's a little bit of work but it really needs some attention to make it a, a whole uh, proper interface so that different cloud providers can plug into that so I think there'll be a lot of work at that extensibility layer to make sure that we can um, uh, write clean interfaces for the other pieces that need to plug into Kubernetes. And that's something that we will prioritize, certainly as a PM group in 1.8. We'll, we'll look forward to that st stability and, and to some of those other extensibility things. So this, um, there's been a couple of folks uh, who have popped up questions, but I think they've all been answered by your talk. So. Um, I really appreciate the thoroughness with which you've done this. Um, a couple of things in terms of other talks that are coming up, there is a service catalog talk, um, deep dive on the 26th. There's an, I, uh, I'm gonna say it wrong. I, I, it's so, it's so, you were the first person I've heard say it out loud. It's so um, talk um, coming up in a, about another month or so. So there's a whole, all these ancillary things um, our, there'll be lots of things, and they'll be on the um, commons.openshift.org events calendar um, if you want to take a look there. Um, so if there is one other person, this is a question I'm going to ask at the end of every uh, one of these sessions, that you want, you or one other topic that you think that we should dive into um, just to, to keep us up to speed or to, to tickle our fancy with what's coming, what would you suggest that we look into next? Um, you know, I think an interesting topic would be machine learning um, and uh, GPU support. Um, that's something that, certainly from a Google Cloud perspective, there's a lot of interest in. I think in general, there's a lot of interest. GPUs have started to be supported on Kubernetes. Um, in fact, we just launched alpha support for GPUs in, um, in Google Cloud, uh, Google's uh, Kubernetes offering. I think that would be an interesting uh, topic for, um, for all of your users. Um, uh, in terms of people, I would suggest Han Goldberg. Um, she's the engine director here. I think she would be phenomenal. Um, 
obviously Clayton, but I'm presuming that you've uh, you've had discussions with Clayton before. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, those are the books that I would. I great suggestion. Suggestion. Yeah, that would be a great topic. I know that um, there's a lot of interest um, across the board. Um, and one, the other thing is that I wanted to also say is it, it's been amazing to see Google's support for Kubernetes and your continued efforts at Google um, to make this community and to support the community and drive it through the CNCF. This has been um, a wonderful experience in terms of community development and open source efforts and, and in large part Google's had um, a big hand in making sure that that handoff over to CNCF and, and it was smooth and effective. So um, uh, thank you for all of your work there. Um, this has been a great update. There'll be another one next week um, as we're gonna dive into other tech talks, but we'll try and set up that machine learning talk. That sounds like a great idea. So thank you very much. And this blog should be up um, and the video will be embedded in it probably in the next day or so. Um, and we'll put the links into this, your, your um, Kubernetes, blog post here and a couple of other references so that people can find all the 1.7 release stuff. So um, again, thanks for not using slides and um, to just talking, talking us through it. So thanks very much. And um, we look forward to hearing you more on some of the other Kubernetes calls. And again, um, we're having you up in Austin as one of our guest speakers for the OpenShift Commons gathering. So we appreciate that greatly. So, and we appreciate everything you're doing. So thanks very much. Thank you so Thank much. You so much.